Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, maximize score after n operations. This one is pretty hard, but it's not as crazy as you might think. And if you're not super familiar with bit masks, this is an opportunity to learn a bit about them. No pun intended. <laughs> but we are given an array of positive integers. And the fact that they're positive integers is only significant because we are going to be running the GCD operation, the greatest common divider, aka the greatest common factor. If you don't remember what that is, consider two numbers, six and nine. What's the greatest factor? between them. I think it is three because we can take six divided by three and it equals two. We can take nine and divide it by three and it equals three. So we get an integer in both cases and we can't really get a larger integer that will divide them. And in this case, they say the size of the array is actually two times n. That's significant because we're told that we're going to be doing n operations where we are going to be choosing two elements from the array and basically removing them to calculate a score. Therefore, we can only do about n operations until we run out of elements from the array because it's of length two times n. So suppose we have an array that looks kind of like this. How many operations would we do in this case? Three, of course, because let's say we're going to be removing two each time and we do that again and then we do that again and then we're out of elements. But what we're going to be doing every time we remove two elements is calculating the GCD between them. And I'm just going to tell you right now that we're not going to get super into that. This is a math function. And in the scope of this problem, we're just allowed to call math.gcd because I think this problem is hard enough. And in a real interview, hopefully your interviewer would tell you that or you could just ask them. But given those two numbers that we removed, we would call GCD on them one and two, find the greatest common divider, which I believe in this case is one. And as we make these n operations, we're going to keep track of how many operations we've made. So if this is our first operation, we're going to take the score or rather the GCD of the two numbers and multiply it by one because this is our first operation. So, so far, our score would be equal to one. Suppose we take two more elements, three and four, calculate the GCD between them, three and four. I believe it is also one in this case. But this time we would take one and multiply it by two because this is the second time we are doing that operation. And then we would take this two and add it to the score, which would get us to a total of three so far. And then at the end, we would do that again and pretty much repeat that operation. But the complicated thing here is that we have flexibility on how we want to calculate these GCDs. So we don't have to do it the way I showed. We actually have choices. We could start with one and six. We could start with one and four. We could start with three and four. It doesn't matter. We have a lot of flexibility, but we want to find the way that maximizes the score. So we want to find the max score we could possibly get doing it this way, which is definitely not going to be easy. I mean, right off the bat, you might think, okay, let's just try like the brute force way, trying every single combination. But you might think, is there room for optimization here? Like, is there some kind of math pattern behind it? Could we maybe sort the array or maybe numbers that are close together going to have a greatest common divider that's larger? Because that's probably what we want to maximize to maximize the score. Well, once you start going down that train of thinking, you kind of realize that even if there is a solution like that, you must need like a math dissertation to figure it out. So probably there isn't going to be some kind of crazy math solution. And again, if there is, you probably just wouldn't be able to figure it out. So then you might go back to the brute force and think if you can somehow try to optimize this. But before we even optimize it, let's just understand how we could even solve this in a brute force way, because it's not trivial, that's for sure. Okay, so starting at the root of our decision tree, because we are going to solve this recursively, let's try to enumerate all possibilities. How would that be? Like, what's our first choice? Well, we can choose any pair of values. We could choose these two values. We could choose this and this. We could choose one and four, et cetera, et cetera. How do we even enumerate those? Well, we're going to need a couple nested for loops, right? And doing that, we realize that at the first layer of our decision tree, we have about n squared choices. That is not going to be very efficient, right? 
And when I'm saying n in this case, let's say n is actually the length of the array, even though in the context of this problem, it means something else. But I think it's more simple to just think about it in terms of n. So we have n squared choices. How many choices are we going to have? Well, if we remove two elements on each choice and the length of our array is n, the height of the tree is probably going to be n divided by two. So overall here, the time complexity is going to be n squared to the power of n divided by 2, which I think would be n to the power of 2 times n, because I think this multiplies with this. Well, I guess the divided by 2 cancels out the 2 here, so this would actually just be roughly n to the power of n, but clearly that's not super efficient. That's even a lot worse than 2 to the power of n. So this is not very efficient, but there is something we can do to speed this up, and the idea is caching. Yes, this is a dynamic programming problem, but it's not a traditional one. We're going to need a bit mask. But first, let me tell you why we can use a bit mask in the first place. There is a constraint on this problem, which is not shown here, but it tells us that the length of this array is at most going to be 14. That's not a very large number at all. Now, it's not enough to pass on leak code if you have a solution that's n to the power of n, that's gonna be a pretty big number. But using this, we can apply caching. Notice something about our decision tree here. Well, instead of drawing out that entire tree, I'm actually just gonna show you on the arrays, it'll be a lot simpler, trust me. Let's say for one of the branches over here, we chose one and two as our first choice. And then maybe on our second choice, we chose three and four. That's one possibility. Let's say on another possibility though, we chose one and three. Then on the second choice, we chose two and four. So even though we made different decisions in our tree, we ended up at the same sub problem. Now the way we calculated the score when we took these elements and we took these elements definitely could be different. I'm not saying the score is the same. I'm saying after we make those choices, the sub problem is the same. So when we have to solve this sub problem, why should we ever have to solve it again? That's the idea that we can apply caching to because we see there's repeated work going on. Now, how do we even define this sub problem? We can't just keep track of it in a single integer, can we? Because here, clearly, we have an array. So what should we do? Maybe we should use an array as the key of our cache. And what that array would represent is for each element, have we already used it or is it available to us? So in this case, we have six positions and we say for the first four, they've already been used. And for the second two and for the last two, they are still available to us. So that's kind of the information we need. And yes, you actually can use an array if you want to. Or maybe you could convert that array into some kind of a string if you want to. That's like delimited by commas. But the most common approach here is to use a bit mask because actually we can represent all of this information in a single integer and we can do it in an integer that's 32 bit because the constraint here is that the max size of the array is going to be 14. So we only need 14 bits. 32 bits should be plenty for us. So instead of using the array to mark whether a value has been used or not, we're going to have an integer that might look like this. Well, it'll have more bits, but we just care about the first six of them. And when we use an integer, like for example, when we use these four, we would take these and turn them into ones like this. And this would evaluate to some integer. I don't know what it is off the top of my head, but it can be used as the key for our cache. In my case, I'm going to use a hash map, but you could also use a array, a one dimensional array. Now, lastly, what are the parameters that we're going to keep track of as we make our recursive calls? Because remember, not only do we have to keep track of which elements we've already used, we have to keep track of what operation we are currently on because that plays into the calculation. We have to remember, take that operation number and then multiply it by the GCD that we end up calculating each time. So at that point, you might think, as we go down this decision tree, we're keeping track of our bit mask, but we're also keeping track of the operation number, which at first might be one, then on the second level might be two, et cetera, et cetera. Should we also use this as a key in our hash map? Well, think about it for a second, and I'll tell you right now, the answer is no, because actually this operation number represents 
redundant information. We don't need to use that as a key in our cache. I mean, technically you could if you want to. I'm pretty sure your solution would pass the same as mine, but it's redundant information. Let me tell you why. Going back to the example, maybe on one branch, I choose these two elements first. On another branch, I choose one and three. Then for the second decision, maybe I choose three and four on one branch. On the other branch, I choose two and four. We ended up at the same sub problem. This is what our bit masks would look like. They would be identical. And not only that, the operation number would also be identical. Operation would be two here and it would be two over here because we have to choose two elements at a time. If the sub problems are the exact same, therefore we must have made the same number of operations here as we did over here. So the operation number is redundant information. We are gonna keep track of it for the calculation, but we don't need to use it as a key in our cache. Okay. So knowing all of that, what are the total number of possibilities that our key value could be? Well, let's say this array is of size n, and for each value, we could either include it or not include it. So we get roughly two to the power of n possible values that our bit mask could be. So this is the number of sub problems. And remember, each time we make a choice, we're making n squared choices on each level of the tree. So we take that and we multiply this by n squared, and that's how we get the overall big O time complexity. Well, technically, we also have to compute the GCD, which I believe is going to be log of the max number in the array, so max of nums, let's say. But I think this is already deep enough for the big O time complexity. I would be surprised if you ever had to know things this in depth in a real interview. So overall, we would take this term and multiply it by this logarithm term. But I think that's enough. So now let's actually code this up. So I usually start these DP problems with my depth first search. And we know we're going to have two parameters. One is going to be the mask, which is going to tell us which numbers are available. And the second is going to be the operation number. I'm going to call it op for short. And the main base case, believe it or not, in this case is just going to be if this mask has already been computed, meaning this is in our DP cache. Well, let me just call it the cache because that's a bit more descriptive. And I'm going to create that cache up above. In my case, I'm going to create a hash map because it makes things more simple. You don't have to know off the top of your head how many possible uh, values we are actually going to be using as the key. But like I said, it's going to be roughly two to the power of the uh, length of nums. So if you wanted to create an array instead of a hash map, that would be the size of your array, maybe a plus one to that. But I'll keep things simple and use a hash map. And if we have computed this subproblem before, let's just go ahead and return the result that we ended up storing. If not, then we actually have to calculate it. And we do that by enumerating all possible choices with a couple nested for loops. So for i in range length of nums and for j in range length of nums. But remember, there's a bit of a bug here. We don't want to have to necessarily count the duplicate uh, pairs. So we should start our second pointer right after the first pointer at i plus one. And now's the part where we want to do our recursive call, right? But we can only do the recursive call for numbers that have not already been chosen. How do we know if the number at index i has already been used? How do we know if the number at index i and the number at index j have both not been used before? Well, that's what our bit mask is for. If the ith bit is one, then that value has already been used before. How do we figure that out? Well, basically we take one, shift it to the left by i, and we take this value and we bitwise and it with the mask value. So for example, if our mask looked something like this, zero, 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 and we wanted to know if maybe this value had already been used before, we would take our one digit, which is over here, shift it to the left by two. So like uh, to put it in this position, and then we would and these together, bitwise and them together. And we would get a one if both of them are one, and we would get a zero if this is a zero. So it works pretty much like you would expect it to. So let's check if this has been used. And let's also check if the other one has been used. So one shifted to the left by J, bitwise or it or bitwise and it with the mask. 
And if either of those have been used before, then we can't use both of them. So therefore we're just gonna continue to the next iteration of the loop. Okay, but if they haven't been used before, what should we do? We probably want to make our recursive call and we probably want to pass in the new mask after we have marked both of them as being used. So let's actually create a new mask after we have marked each of those positions, which we can do like this mask logic or with one shifted to the left by I and then bitwise or that with one shifted to the left by J. The difference between the bitwise and and the bitwise or is that and is basically us reading the value. When we bitwise or, we're pretty much overwriting the value at that location. Now that we have the new mask, we can pass that in as a parameter. And for the second parameter, we probably want to pass in the current operation number plus one. But what exactly are we going to do with this recursive call? What were we trying to do in the first place? Remember, we were trying to calculate the score of the two values that we just chose. How do we calculate the score of them? Well, that's the part where we just use math.gcd in Python because this problem is hard enough and we don't wanna get super into the math. So we're just gonna call gcd on the two numbers that we are currently choosing. And we say that's our score. But remember, we actually want to multiply this by the operation number as well. It's easy to forget, so try not to. And then using that score, we want to take that and add it with the return value of our DFS over here. But this is just one possibility. We are enumerating all the possibilities and trying to determine the maximum. So what we're gonna say here is the cache for this mask value is going to be the max of itself cache with mask as the key and whatever value we ended up calculating here. Let me clean this up a tiny bit. So this is the recursive step where we try to find the maximum. There's a tiny bug here though. What happens if we try to access this value if we haven't already inserted mask as a key? Well, we're gonna get an exception thrown. And an easy way to fix that would be before we even start the loop, just say uh, cache mask is equal to zero, just initialize it to some value like zero. But an even simpler way, at least in Python, would be just to make this uh, dictionary, this uh, hash map, a default dict like this, collections.default dict, where the default value is going to be an integer. So this will basically uh, do what I talked about previously. This will evaluate to zero if the key hasn't already been inserted uh, yet. Now, after this loop has terminated, we will have the max stored. So let's go ahead and return it out here. And finally, now that we've wrapped up the DFS, let's go ahead and actually call the DFS and return the return value. Our mask initially, we don't even need to create a variable for this. Remember, it's just an integer. We can just pass in zero like this. Now for the operation number, we're not starting at zero. We're starting at one and then incrementing it each time that we call the DFS. So this is the entire code. Remember the time complexity was roughly n squared for the for loops and the number of times we're gonna be solving the sub problem and caching it is going to be two to the power of n and to actually calculate the GCD each time in the nested for loops is going to be log m where let's say m is the max integer in our number array. Now let's run this to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes it does and it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.